Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to uh, be with you again this Sunday morning. And we just pray that you can enjoy the service as uh, we worship the Lord and as we look at His Word. And uh, wherever you're at, I just pray that uh, you sense the Spirit of God move as we uh, go through the service. I want to remind you that uh, you can catch the Sunday School lesson uh, with Brother Brett online uh, through YouTube or Facebook. Uh, he has uh, put the lesson together and you can watch that uh, as soon as you watch this service. Uh, I just pray that uh, if you're there and your Sunday School class happens to be still one of those that are needing to Zoom, that you'll plug in and not miss the opportunity to uh, be a part of your Sunday School lesson. Right now, before we begin worship, let's pray. Father, we thank you again. We thank you, Lord, that this morning we are able to come together and worship you. That our hearts and our spirits, uh, even though we may be separated right now physically, our hearts and spirit are together, uh, unified as we worship. And we just pray again that we'll glorify you in every way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
sing, your enemies flee. And when you sing, your prison walls come falling down. So just begin to sing and lift your hallelujah and let it rise to the King like a symphony. Everything to you, Jesus, we lift it all to you. I raise the hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much, praise team, for lifting us to the throne of mercy and grace and rearing back and worshiping Jesus, King Jesus our Lord. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 43 this morning. Isaiah chapter 43 this morning. We're going to read verse 1 through 13, and uh, we're going to look at a subject that I'm calling the chosen ones. The chosen ones. So... If you have your Bible there handy or you have your cell phone handy and you've looked the scripture up, you follow along as I read. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. 
When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for, you, for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no one or no other Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one that can take anything out of my hand. There is no one who can reverse any of it. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this word of truth that you've given us. And we just ask God that we would realize, that we would realize once again, or maybe for the first time, that you have chosen us. And that's why we get to belong to you. And we pray these things in your holy name for your glory and honor. Amen. Oh, how good it feels to be chosen. Whether it's in team sports, and oh, how I remember being chosen last in many of those team sports when I was growing up. Uh, just hoping, hoping. I didn't care if I was chosen last as long as I got chosen. Or maybe you're chosen to be the one to have that part in a play. Or maybe you were chosen to give the speech. Or maybe you're chosen to be a witness for Christ. Oh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, maybe it came crashing down on you that God chose you, and not only did he choose you, but he made you sit with him in the heavenlies. Did you realize that we have a front row seat, that God not only chose us, but he chose us to have a front row seat in the heavenlies? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 and following, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now that's just an incredible thought that God chose us and he has given us a front row seat in the heavenly places. Yes, we are the chosen ones. But let's look at that and unpack it just a little bit. He chose us before. Look at verse 1 in Isaiah 43. 43 verse 1a, actually. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Now the idea that God chose us before is all over the scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, God created us for good works, which God prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. You see, God redeemed us before we deserved it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God chose us beforehand, before we were even 
thinking about him, he chose us. I remember when we were carrying that cross uh, many years ago across this country, and we were carrying the cross. It happened to be my turn. I've shared this many, many times, and I'll share it more times until we all get back to heaven, or we get to heaven, and then I'll tell it some more there. But as we were carrying the cross on 50 Highway, I noticed that there was a man coming out of his front door. Now, 50 Highway in Indiana, it, it doesn't have much shoulder. You're right there in people's front yards nearly. The mailbox is right there on the side of the road. And I saw this man coming out to get his mail. And I'm carrying the cross, and as I'm carrying it, and I'm watching his uh, trajectory, I, I realize the cross and he are going to get at that mailbox at the same time. And sure enough, as he was reaching into his mailbox and lifting his hands, the shadow of the cross, this was evening time, the sun was behind me, the shadow of the cross literally crossed over his face. And he said, whoa, what are you doing? And I said, I'm glad you asked. We'd made a commitment that we would not be overly zealous in speaking to people first as we were doing this prayer walk across America. But if someone asks us, we're going to stop right there and answer that question. I said, well, I, I'm glad that you asked. And I began to talk to the, him uh, about what we were doing. And I began to visit with him about Jesus. And he kind of interrupted me a little bit. And he said, you know, two weeks ago, I was standing at my brother's bedside. My brother was dying in the hospital. And my brother's pastor was there to pray with him. And my brother is a believer in Christ. And uh, the pastor was uh, praying with him. And, and uh, I guess my brother probably had coached the pastor just a little bit because he made a beeline at me. And he said, I want to know, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? And I answered the pastor and said, no. And then the pastor began to share what it meant to be saved. And uh, so I asked him as we were stopped they're talking, I asked this gentleman at the mailbox, well, did you give your heart to Jesus? And he said, no, I did not. And then I began to share with him, I want you to think about this for just a minute. We started this prayer walk with the cross on August the 3rd in Los Angeles, literally out over uh, in, in the Santa Monica Pier, out over the Pacific Ocean. We started coming from the west to the east, and our destination is Washington, D.C. And here we are in Indiana on the side of 50 Highway, and, and we've come hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles carrying this cross, and you're coming out to get your mail, and God, God planned it so that just at the right time that your path would meet the shadow of the cross. And I said, is there any reason he already knew the gospel? The other pastor had told him the ABCs of salvation. I said, is there any reason you wouldn't give your heart to Jesus? Before he was saying a word, he fell on his knees and he was already praying. Now, I'm here to tell you that God chose us before we were ever looking for him. He chose us. And he prepared the situation that we might accept him. But not only did he choose us before uh, we deserved it, while we were sinners, and not only did he choose us before we were choosing him, but he chose us by name. He chose us by name. Look at the second part of that same verse, 43, verse 1b. And, and he formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name. You are mine. Now, here's the deal. As God is looking all through history and God is looking at the lineup, not only did he choose you before, but he came up to the line and he stopped and he called you by name and said, you're mine. You're mine. Isn't that incredible to think that Creator God, Almighty God, would spend the energy and take the time and effort to not only call us, but call us by name? 
He didn't say, y'all come, which the Bible does say, whosoever will may come, but God speaks our name when he calls us. In verse 5, the Bible says not only did he honor us, and then in verse 4 he says we're precious in his sight and, and we're honored in his sight, and he tells us again that he loves us. But in verse 5, not only does he know our name, but he knows who our descendants are. And he's going to call them. The Bible says he's going to call them out of the east, out of the west, out of the north, and out of the south, and he will gather them all up. He knows our descendants. I remember preaching, uh, oh goodness, this was in 1994, preaching right here at, in this place. And I'm telling a story, and you know I like to tell stories, and I'm telling a story about Clarence and Mary Epperson back in Oklahoma, and uh, that God had put it on my heart to call them. I hadn't seen them in two years, but God put it on my heart to call them, and so I did because God's Spirit was telling me to. And as I was calling them, I said, Lord, you know I've witnessed to Clarence and Mary Epperson many, many times, taking great advantage of this out to, to uh, try to convince them to come to Christ. And, uh, and so if I call them today, Lord, then you need to save them. You know, I, I, he, he told me to call them, and so I thought, well, you know, as part of the conversation, you, you need to save them. And I called them, and I'm telling you, as I'm standing here, in less than 45 seconds, Clarence gave his heart to Jesus, Clarence Epperson. We were talking there on the phone, and, and again, he knew the gospel by heart. He'd been witnessed to so many times. He was about 86 years old, and his wife Mary was about 85, and uh, he knew it by heart. And I said, Clarence. And I, I used his name. I said, Clarence, is there any reason you wouldn't give your heart to Jesus? And again, in less than 45 seconds, asking that question, he said, I'm ready. And he gave his heart to Jesus right there on the telephone. Now, the interesting thing about that story in September of 1994 is that there was a Clarence present in this worship service. And he was seated right back here to my, to my left, to your right. And when I said, Clarence, is there any reason you wouldn't give your heart to the Lord? All he heard was Holy Spirit. He, 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 he jumped out of the story about Clarence Epperson. And all he heard was the Holy Spirit calling him by name. And that's when... As we gave the invitation, the altar call, Clarence Lance came flying down this aisle right over here and did a power slide as he came around the corner. And he said, I'm ready to give my heart to Jesus. I'm telling you, folks, that not only does he call us before, but he calls us by name. You read again Acts chapter 9, the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And Jesus says, Paul, Paul, or he says, Saul, Saul, uh, why are you persecuting me? Now, here's the interesting thing about this story. If you go to Acts 9, you can, you can find it in verse 5. He, uh, Paul said back to Jesus, well, who are you, Lord? You see, Paul didn't know who it was. And Jesus said back to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Here is the interesting thing, that not only does Jesus call us by name, but he is a very gracious and merciful and loving God, and he introduces himself to us. And there is no mistake when Jesus calls us to be one of his own, there is no mistake who's doing the calling. And it's a wonderful thing that he calls us not only before, but calls us by name. We know that we know that we know that we know that it is Jesus who is calling us. And finally, not only does he choose us before and he chooses us by name, but we are chosen for keeps. Now, there's a lot of things to unpack in this chapter, but we don't have time to unpack all of it. 
Uh, one of those things is he chose us to be a witness, and I, I, I could spend a whole sermon on that. But I want you to look at verse 13. If you'll just skip down to the bottom. He chose us for keeps. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, I am God. And there is no one who can take anything out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Now, here's the neat thing about this. As God is getting at this stuff, God plays for keeps. There is nothing temporary with God. He plays for keeps. And the Holman translation says this, also from today on, I am God alone, and no one can take anything from my hand. I act, and who can re reverse it? You see, God plays for keeps so much that John 3.16 says, and we could say it together, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he gave his only begotten son, that he gave his only begotten son, that he plays for keeps, that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever receives him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only does God play for keeps in the sense that he offers his son up, but he plays for keeps in regard to giving us eternal life, and he proclaims ownership on our lives. John 6, 39 says, This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. In John 10, 27, 28, My sheep know me, and, they, and I know them, and they hear my voice, and there is no power can snatch them out of my hand. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, in Romans chapter 8, it doesn't get any better than this. And I'll just tell you, this is my favorite sermon to preach. It just is about the keeping power of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall have the power to snatch them out of my hand and separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. My friends, is God choosing you today? That's the question. Bow your head with me. Father, you know everyone that's listening there at the houses and you know what's going on in their heart and your spirit goes before your word and you prepare the way. And if there's anyone in listening voice of your word and your message today, Lord, I pray that they can recognize your voice, Jesus, calling them, calling them to come unto you. If you happen to be one of those and you've never made that commitment to Jesus or maybe you have made a commitment to Jesus, maybe you were a young boy or you were a teenager but somehow you got lost in life's way and you're wanting to come back, I want you to simply pray a prayer like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, you can just repeat it with me there at your house. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Would you forgive me? I believe you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins long before this moment. And I believe that God raised you from the dead long before this moment. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. And Jesus, I promise to follow you the rest of my life. In your name I pray, amen. My friends, if you were able to pray that prayer, Come on in to the kingdom of God because he saved a front row seat for you in the heavenlies. God bless you. Have a great day.